Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Bittner, and I'm with the ESRD National Coordinating Center. Thank you for joining us today for the ESRD NCC Patient Education Quickenar. The ESRD NCC Quickenar events are held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We are hosting these 30-minute events weekly. They feature patient and professional subject matter experts from around the country sharing how they or their organization are coping with situations related to COVID-19. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that this call is being recorded and will be posted on the NCC COVID Click on our webpage, usually within uh, 72 hours, if not earlier. So let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda for today's call. We have uh, two speakers for today. First is Linda Ball, who is with the ESRD Network 13, which serves Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Also joining us is Julie Glennon from Florida, who is going to be sharing her personal experiences related to her hemodialysis access. Today they will be discussing uh, dialysis access care during the COVID-19 environment. As our speakers go through their presentation, and if you have questions, Please submit them using the chat feature through WebEx or the Q&A, uh, which you will probably find on your, the lower right of your screen. When we get to the question and answer section of this presentation, we will share the questions we've received with our speakers. Our goal is to answer as many questions as time allows. So what is this call about? While uh, earlier we provided a quick overview of the call, uh, you have an opportunity to hear tips for coping in a COVID-19 environment, learn about real world experiences that you can put to use and share with others, and engage with the calls um, on a uh, regular basis on a variety of topics. So uh, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers. I'd like to first introduce Linda Ball, who's been recognized as a national and international vascular access expert. She's published more than 30 articles on vascular access, participated in the uh, fistula first video cannulation of the arterial venous fistula, also known as AVF, authored a cannulation chapter in a surgeon textbook, as well as the vascular access chapter in the new ANA core curriculum. Her on-course with cannulation workshop has been attended by more than 1,000 nurses and technicians across the country. Linda is the past president or a past president of the American Nephrology Nurses Association, and she is currently the Quality Improvement Director at Network 13. Julia Glennon, who you're going to hear from later on, as I said, she's from Florida, and she's going to share her experiences with us um, and her need for access care interventions. Uh, thank you both Linda and Julie for being here today. And Linda, we're going to turn the presentation um, over to you at this time. All right. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to speak. Kim, the slides are not advancing. Matt, can you provide some? Are they? Let me go. Let me go ahead and see if I can fix that. I'm not sure what's going on. All right. Well, I'll just get started here. Um, let's talk about a properly functioning access and issues that can impact it. You know, there are several other parameters that I can use in addition to direct access evaluation. Uh, properly functioning access will have a direct impact on your adequacy of dialysis. The less problems you have, the better your KT over V will be. Your doctor orders your time on dialysis and blood pump speed to achieve that adequate dialysis. But problems such as poor needle placement, which could be a needle near a curve or up against the wall, a stenosis, which is a narrowing of the vessel, or damage to the access that causes clotting will cause staff to turn down your blood pump speed, impacting your adequacy. The pressure alarms on your machine can give me a clue as to a stenosis, especially if I see a more negative arterial pressure, the pump pulling against the flow, or a high venous pressure where the blood is being pushed back into the bloodstream through a pipe that is narrowed. 
There should be no difficulty inserting needles. Problems such as staff having difficulty threading the needle, getting a flashback when inserting the needle, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms that reduce the cannulation zone, scabs that haven't healed, or extended bleeding time at the end of dialysis that could suggest a stenosis. You should feel a strong thrill, which is either a purring or a vibration, not a thump like a bass drum. You should start at the anastomosis, which is where the artery and the vein are attached. And this should have the strongest purring or vibration and continue on up your access. The sensation should fade, but if a second strong thrill further up on your access occurs, then you probably have a stenosis. You should hear a, a continuous brewy, and that's a whooshing sound. Um, you may have been taught to use a stethoscope, and if so, you would start at the anastomosis again, and this you'd hear this whooshing sound, and it connects one sound to the next sound, and that's normal. So it should sound like this, whoosh, 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 whoosh. So it just never stops. One just falls right over on top of the other. Um, but if you hear sounds that have a pause in it, it could mean that there's a problem. So if it sounds like this, or that could indicate that you might have a stenosis in your access. Remember, there should only be one thrill and one brewy. These are the clues that staff are looking, listening, and feeling for when they assess your access. So I think I have an access infection. So what are some of the signs and symptoms that you should be looking for? Tenderness. Sometimes a tenderness over your access. You know, you put your fingers on and go, oh, that's uncomfortable. Um, that can be a warning sign that you've got an, an infection that's kind of um, underneath the surface of the skin waiting to come out. Redness. Notice the fistula the first picture on the top left there, notice that big scab area and that redness around it? That is an exit site infection. On the catheter to the right there, you could not only see the redness, but it looks like there's some drainage coming out of there. You might have the staff see, the, see where the skin, um, the catheter is underneath the skin there. You may have staff that will run their fingers down the sides of that and press, and sometimes that's uncomfortable, but they're checking to see if there's any pus or any other drainage that might come out that exit site there. Um, that would indicate that you have a tunnel infection. So this person could have both. They could have a tunnel infection as well as an exit site infection. Infected access might also be swollen, along with that tenderness we talked about. Now, not every swollen access means that it's an infection. That could also mean that you've got a blockage someplace that's forced the fluid to stay in your, in your access arm. Fever and or chills. Has your temperature changed from normal? An elevated temperature or fever could indicate an infection. You could also feel chilled as well as having that temperature. So if this happens while at home before your dialysis treatment, remember you should call ahead because you may have to go through the COVID protocol um, at your dialysis unit. In catheter and grafts, there's one more issue that you need to watch for, and that's skin erosion. There is an exit site for a catheter, but you, if you see a piece of catheter showing that's in the tunnel, this is caused by the skin thinning out over the catheter. So take a look at the bottom picture there where that, that arrow is pointing to. That should have skin over it. You shouldn't be able to see that little piece of white catheter there. So that just tells me that either sometimes it comes over your bone, your collarbone, and it just kind of rubs, and it wears away the skin. Um, and the problem with this is, is that bacteria can get in that area and it can go down the outside of that catheter and go all the way back to your heart and give you a bloodstream infection.
So it's really important that if you notice that you've got some skin missing like that, you want to cover it with a, with a Band-Aid, because Band-Aids are sterile if you don't touch the white part of it, and cover that up. And then um, as soon as you get to dialysis, you need to tell your nurse about it because she needs to let the doctor know. Uh, does that mean you can't dialyze? No, you can dialyze, um, but you need to get this needs attention right away. Typically, it means that they might have to take that catheter out and put it someplace else. Um, also, your graft is completely under the skin. So if you ever see any part of your graft, and it would be white, just like that catheter would be, again, you want to cover it and let your nurse know before cannulation. Never let anybody cannulate an exposed graft area. My access isn't working. Now what do I do? Do not go to the emergency room. It could put you at unnecessary risk for COVID-19 exposure. You want to call the dialysis unit and let them know that your access is clotted, no thrill, no brewy. Uh, maybe you can request a telehealth visit with your kidney doctor. They can look at your access on the screen and they can see if there's other issues with your access, like an infection or a problem with an aneurysm, for instance. This will give them more information so you get the right intervention. Direct scheduling will reduce the amount of wait time around other people. Some of you may have an access center near you. Others don't have one in their community, so surgery would need to be scheduled. Know what your plan will be before something happens to your access. If there's no way to get your access repaired right away, you might need to have a catheter so you can get your dialysis treatment. But just remember, don't delay. You do need to get dialysis. So now let's talk about some tips on how to avoid hospitalization. First of all, you need to prevent infection. Um, hygiene is really important, and I'm sure you've been hearing about hygiene day and night, but wash or sanitize your hands for 20 seconds, especially after touching doorknobs, railings, elevator buttons, door push plates, and avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth because these are mucous membranes that when bacteria uh, touches that area, it can be absorbed right into your body right away. You want to mask in public and keep your distance. It might be a good idea if you carry sanitizer, hand sanitizer with you, and use it often. Immunize. It's almost flu season, so make sure that you receive your flu shot and the two recommended pneumococcal vaccines, the PPSB23 and the Prevnar 13. You should have them both for the best protection against pneumonia. Dialyze. I know you're receiving a mixed message. Stay home, but don't go to, di go to dialysis. Don't miss your treatments, right? So what do you do? You make sure that you go to your dialysis treatments, but it's so important that you follow the other um, infection prevention um, hygiene uh, recommendations from the CDC to keep you safe. In addition, you want to make sure to take your medications. Follow your renal diet. Remember, electrolyte imbalances, especially potassium, could require hospitalization. And follow your fluid restrictions. Fluid overload and heart failure are a large percentage of hospitalizations for kidney patients. And know your access. Check your access daily for the thrill. Look for signs and symptoms of infection. And let the staff know if it feels or looks different. You may not have the same staff every dialysis treatment, but your access is with you 24-7. And I just want to spend a little bit of time just talking about this essential versus non-essential surgery during COVID-19. Um, and what does that mean anyways? Essential is something that's emergent. Uh, a ruptured appendix, for instance, okay, um, uh, an automobile accident where you've got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, problems associated with that. Those can't wait. Non-essential means, um, can I let it wait for another week or two? Will it impact me? And if it won't impact me, then, then I should be able to wait. That's what non-essential means. So on March the 18th, 
Um, CMS recommended suspension of non-essential surgery. So then all of a sudden, the providers and nephrologists said they were having trouble um, getting you scheduled for uh, placement of access or repair of access or getting central venous catheters put in and even PD catheters put in. Um, and so they went to CMS and said, this is a problem. And so on March the 26th, CMS clarified dialysis access as an essential surgery. Now, the U.S. College of Surgeons, based on what the March 18th recommendation was, developed this three-tier elective uh, guidelines, triaging, and they had three tiers. So we're going to take a look at tier three first, and those are the things that you're not going to postpone. So if your access is clotted or your access is so poor that you're not getting good dialysis at all, then we can't postpone that. You need to have that access fixed or another one placed. You have an infected dialysis access. You know we can't let that go, so you don't postpone that. A fistula revision for ulceration. What does that mean? Remember those aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms we were talking about, those big ugly bumps that you get on your arm? Well, sometimes they start to leak, they get um, scabs over them, um, or layers of tissue start to become missing. There's a risk that those could rupture. And so those really need to be repaired immediately. We can't wait. We can't expect that, oh, it's, nothing's going to happen for a week or two. No, something could happen in 10 minutes, right? You've just newly been diagnosed with kidney failure and you need dialysis. Well, you need an access for dialysis, so we can't postpone that. And then they said dialysis tunneled catheters, we can't postpone that. That's how we're going to get people their dialysis treatments by putting that in. So 2B and 2A here, the um, fistula revision for malfunction or steel syndrome. Now, what does that mean? That means you're having a problem with your access. Maybe your flows are getting lower and lower, um, but they're still at that minimum. They're above that minimum level they say is okay to keep your access running. Um, or maybe you're starting to, to get really, really cold hands or you're starting to develop some pain in your hand from steel syndrome from that access that was placed. Um, can it wait? Or is it so important that that has to be fixed right now? All right, so they say postpone if possible. How about a fistulogram for that, for that malfunction? Do we really need that right now, or can we postpone that? And people who need a fistulograph for, for end-stage renal disease, that means you're on dialysis, that you need dialysis. Um, is it really important to put in a fistulograph? Now, remember, this was a couple days before they said it was essential now. So they were saying that that's not essential, but a dialysis tunneled catheter is essential. And also, people in stage four and five, so um, they're not quite ready for dialysis yet. Should we place that access right this minute, or can we postpone it? All right, so that was the tier system that was put up, you know, but in some parts of the country, this tier system is still kind of in place. Um, and why is that? Well, now that people are starting to do surgery again, there were a lot of people waiting in line to get surgery and getting procedures done. There's been, now they're short-staffed. Remember, they closed down the surgery centers. You know, they closed down surgery. And so they had to put staff someplace else or they furlough them. So they're, they're not available. So they have to get them back. Um, some places are still experiencing a lack of, of uh, PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, and some of the local hospital associations and local hospitals have set strict guidelines for surgeries. And so some people, you may have to have a, uh, a COVID test before you have surgery. What happens if there's no testing in your area yet and you can't get a test? Then you're not going to have surgery according to what the hospital has said. So there's all kinds of issues you may not be aware of of why you can't get that access fixed now or get a new access right now. So there was a consumer survey that was conducted in five big cities, and over 2,000 people responded regarding medical care during COVID-19. And the first question had to do with hospital versus non-hospital settings. 76.5% said they preferred getting care in a setting that wasn't connected to a hospital versus 23.5% that didn't mind having to go to a hospital-based setting. 
The second question was about surgery in a hospital versus surgery in a surgery center or an ambulatory care setting. 53.8% agreed um, to surgery taking place in the hospital when it was recommended by their doctor. 46.2% would prefer surgery to take place in a surgical center away from the hospital. And their third question was about going to an emergency room. 22.6% said they wouldn't go to the ER for medical symptoms. They would handle the emergency themselves. And 77.5% said that they would trust the hospital to keep them safe. So I'm going to say, how would you answer these questions? Well, we have someone here today that has had an access experience that they would like to share. So right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Julie Glennon. Uh, from Florida. She's been a kidney patient for 32 years, and she'll be sharing her access experience during COVID-19. So welcome, Julie, and thank, thank you for you. taking the time to share your story today. My pleasure. So can you tell me, how long have you had your fistula? Um, I've had this fistula since October of 2016. And what kind of problems have you experienced over this last four years with this fistula? I would say every four to five months, sort of like clockwork, um, I start prolonged bleeding at the end of the treatment. So I average maybe two fistula grams a year. So this year, um, maybe around um, April, I started with the prolonged bleeding again. Uh, so I was concerned, obviously, in the middle of the pandemic. So you know, what did you do? Um, well, I postponed it for about a month. And then the bleeding really got quite bad. So my nurses insisted I call my surgeon. So uh, I did call them and asked if they were even doing procedures and they said they were. So um, I went in and I had an ultrasound and they said that there was stenosis in my upper armpit and that I did need a fistula gram. So maybe a week later, they did schedule that for me. Okay, now, were you going to have this procedure done in a hospital, or were you going to go to an access center? Uh, this is an access surgical center. Okay, and can you explain the process um, that you had to go through um, this last time because of COVID? Yeah, um, well, they called me the day before and said when I arrive that I need to stay in my car and that they, um, I call them, and they'll come out and get me. So they came out and get me and uh, took my temperature right away. I did not need any COVID testing, but they did ask, you know, the usual questions. Have I been around someone with COVID? Do I have shortness of breath, coughing? Um, and then they just took me inside, obviously with a mask. They were masked. They had gloves on, gowns on. Um, so they were very, very safe. And this was a lot different than the last time you went in for for a procedure? Um, I would say so, you know, with the temperature, waiting in the car, you know, extra precautions were taken. Can you tell us how you felt about the changes that you've had to go through at dialysis and at the access center um, and what your feelings are about this COVID crisis that's happening and you being at high risk because you're a dialysis patient? Um, it is scary. I mean, obviously, we're all wearing masks uh, during treatment, which is not the easiest. I have a new appreciation for the nurses wearing these masks for so many hours. <laughs> I would say I'm there about four and a half hours, and it's it's a little claustrophobic and hot with that mask on the whole time, but, you know, it is something that's necessary. Well, Julie, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, if you can stay with us, um, I'll turn it back over to Kim and Jerome for the Q&A section. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, both Linda and Julie, for um, sharing uh, both your expertise and your experience, Julie. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, Matt, I'd like to check in with you to see if we received any um, questions through the chat or the Q&A. We have. Um, I think we have time for about two of these questions. Um, I think they're all related to, Linda, I'm going to go back to your, um, your images you had there of all the different infection types. Um, I think that spurred some questions. 
Um, question is, with COVID-19, I'm trying to exercise more. Um, what types of exercise should I avoid because of my fistula? Well, really what you want to make sure is, is that um, nothing hits your access wherever it's located. So you want to make sure that you don't have, you know, that you're doing something where it's actually going to press and put force against your access. Otherwise, there really shouldn't be any restrictions unless you're, unless you're fresh out of surgery for a, a new access. So you say the first, the first seven to 10 days, you shouldn't lift more than five pounds. Any time after that, there shouldn't be any restrictions at all about how much weight that you can lift. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Another one that I see, um, and this might be a slash COVID slash infection question, um, is a tanning salon dangerous to my graft? And, and are there any associated risks with those tanning salons and COVID would be a, a secondary part of that. Well, um, I don't know that I've ever read anything about that. We know that, that of course, tanning beds aren't good for your skin overall, um, that they're, that, that puts you at risk for, uh, potential, ex you know, cancer exposure. Um, but I, other than that, um, I don't have any information that I can share with you about that. I'm going to have to Google that and see if I can find anything. Um, really, I don't know that since it's underneath the surface of your skin, it really shouldn't impact that. But uh, the only things that really impact your flow of your your access is your blood pressure. If your blood pressure gets extremely low, then you can clot your access. But um, otherwise, um, there may not be any kind of ramification per se to your access. But I would ask your doctor that question. Very good. Thank you. Um, and we have time for one more. Um, in this environment, I mean, we've, um, and Julie's talked about it, and you talked about, you know, how important it is to with hygiene. Should we be cleaning our access sites more often than we should we have normally been doing? Well, if normal means that you've been cleaning your access before um, you sit down in your chair, um, you need to do that. Uh, that's that's pretty much a given. You should make sure at home that uh, you take those uh, band aids off that you've got or the dressings that you have on your access, you should um, clean the access sites off, especially if there's any blood there, um, because that is a source of, of uh, nourishment for bacteria. So you wanna make sure that your access is clean and pat it dry. Um, other than that, if it's hot and sticky outside, if you live in a part of the country where it's very, very humid, um, you want to make sure that you might clean your access a little more frequently because the stickiness of the humidity in the air will attract bacteria and it will stick to your skin more. And so frequent cleaning there um, will be more helpful for you. Very good. Thank you. Um, and, and one last question just came in for Julie. Um, have you changed your routines for the hygiene for your access since COVID-19? I would say I've always been uh, very OCD about it, so it's probably <laughs> stayed the same as I've always, you know, kept it very, very clean and been very, very careful with it. As I've had so many accesses, I don't have, you know, many left. Very good. Thank you, Drew. Um, I, I think that's going to bring us to the end of our Q&A. We are uh, almost at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, and so I just want to take a moment and say thank you to Julie and, and Linda, of course, uh, for being with us today. Um, hopefully, our attendees have found your uh, information to be helpful today, um, and, and we appreciate you being here to share it with us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and, and we'll wrap up. Uh, before we do, let's talk a bit about the kidneyhub.org. Um, if you haven't heard about this yet, and if you've been here, you should have, uh, this mobile-friendly web tool was developed with the uh, help of patient subject matter experts and the NCC to link to important resources, re resources such as COVID-19, uh, infection prevention, what we just talked about today. Uh, and there are all sorts of resources available uh, on this mobile tool, right from your smartphone, right from your tablet, that can help you to learn more about these uh, infection prevention and other topics. Uh, so we invite you. Take a look today uh, at thekidneyhub.org on your mobile device and bookmark it to your home screen and let us know what you would like to see 
out there. Uh, our next provider uh, provider focused event is July 15th. That is uh, one uh, one day. Sorry, I'm used to saying one week. One day from today that is tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And our next patient focused event would be July 21st. It is one week from today. 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, those events will be available for registration out at www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Uh, you can learn more about those events and register for them uh, from that page. So on behalf of the NCC, we just wanted to thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, there are some COVID-19 resources available on your screen. I invite you to visit them. And if you have any questions about these or any other resources that we may be able to provide you, our contact information is on the screen. Uh, NCCinfo at hsag.com is our email address. Uh, so again, thank you for your time today. We hope that you found it informative, and we hope that we'll see you on a future QuickNR event. Have a wonderful afternoon.